After 65 years of independence, tonight we're asking the hard and uncomfortable question about whether we are truly independent as the Republic of Ghana. After this break, the best man to do the conversation is the person I have in the studio here. In 1957, the British colony of Ghana, that is supposed to be Gold Coast, became the independent uh, nation of Ghana. There's a question about whether or not, after 65 years, we've done the things that we are supposed to do. And there are so many questions about whether we've headed the right direction, but above them all is the question about whether we are truly independent as a state. That question will be answered, plus others, by a man that is difficult to kill out a part of his uh, profile because he's done way too many things. And, well, uh, my guest is a household name in Ghana here, for especially those who lived through the 80s, and uh, my production team excluded. He's a communication consultant. He's a journalist and a public relations expert by pro profession. He's also a statesman and a Pan-Africanist. He has served Ghana at various levels, also Africa and the various teachers of the world. He's been the editor of the Daily Graphic, as the point they call the People's Daily Graphic. Yes. And he's been the director of the Ghana Institute of Journalism, too. He was a member of parliament for Aguna East between 1992 and 2000, in case you've forgotten or probably you are not aware. And he was a deputy minister of information, too, and minister of state for Central and Ashanti region. Indeed, one of the poster charts for a conversation about a man who is posted to be minister in a place that he is not from is the very person that I'm talking about here. And there are so many other things that in later parts he's done. But by now, you know he's the founding president of the African University College of Communications. John Abu Kojianka, you're welcome. I have to cut the short so that I don't spend all of my time dealing with that profile. <laughs> it amazes me. Thank you, How does a man get to do all of these things in a lifetime? Well, it shows that there's no, there's no limit to what man can do. It's interesting. I, 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 of course, I mean, you've done a lot of other things too. I was recently having a conversation with you about Inspector Bediako. And for those of you who did not know, he wrote it. He's actually the brain behind it anyway. Now, I want us to do a little bit of the... I'm digging into your Pan-African self. And I, 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 I saw your book about Jamestown. The, the, I think it was really about the history of this country. And yes, he has written a lot of books. In the course of this conversation, I'll let you in with some of the things that he has written in very profound books that you'd be interested in reading too. Let me welcome you once again. Thank you, Raymond. Are we truly independent? It, it's, it's a question that are many are unable to answer directly. My direct answer is we are not. What happened on... 6th March 1957. See, 6th March 1957 uh, was the culmination of the struggles of people of the Gold Coast um, against British domination. So we got there, and it must have started long ago before that date. Uh, some people mistakenly take it from the time of the UGCC, United Gold Coast Convention, but much, much earlier, you know, there were people wait from the, from the, from 1920, the 20s, when Ifrima Moore was protesting against uh, going to church, not being allowed to wear okay. traditional cloth and all that. This were, they were all protests. There were people who protested um, against taxation on cocoa. There were people who protested uh, chiefs who protested against domination of the British. Some chiefs in Ghana and elsewhere were exiled because they were against uh, British domination. They were all forms of protests, uh, but they all had to, uh, you know, buy their time. And other people came up until the UGCC was formed to galvanize all the protests. And then, of course, UGC itself invited Kwame Nkrumah to come from the UK because they knew of his organizational abilities. He also came down, found the pace too slow, uh, moved out, formed his um, youth organization, later turned into 
CPP, and then led Ghana to independence. That, that's a serious chronology. It, it actually tracks history all through it and actually to the point of independence. There's currently a conversation, I'm dragging you into it, about whether or not we have founders or uh, found that I think there was an individual or a group of people founded the Republic of Ghana. I don't think any group of people founded Ghana. The founding of Ghana was the work of a group, uh, sorry, a, a succession of people, okay. individuals and groups. Mm -hmm. As I'm saying, from the 20s, 30s, yeah. 30, 40 years, look at the uh, 28th February event. Yeah. Uh, look at those who went on strike and closed their shops and all that against the British. They were all forms of protest. The UGCC, yes, was an organized group uh, that wanted to uh, lead because all these um, protests were scattered. So they all get, got together. And as I'm saying, um, they had a program. They invited Kwame Nkrumah for whatever reason. And Kwame Nkrumah also came, found their pace too slow or thinking that the as they said, um, self-government was not defined in terms of when. He decided self-government now. Yeah. So he led. Okay. So I will not spend my time on who founded Ghana. I, yeah. will, I will say that Kwame Nkrumah led the final leg of the process. Okay. Now, I'm moving into the conversation, and, and there's this point that's always been thrown into. Um, I remember reading some bit of British history and how the... Did they believe that Britain got got an independence, and this was as a result of actions of some Ghanaian nationalists, all through led by Kwame Nkrumah? There's also some thinking by the likes of Noam Chomsky and Co, who believe that the independence was not really what we fought for, but it was actually granted us, uh, like other states have theirs. You know, the pressure was too much for the British. I, I think that we, 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 we fought for it. And it, mm. as I'm saying, it wasn't just the 40s okay. or the 50s, as we have. Prior to that. Yeah, yeah, prior to that, there have been several protests in but various countries. But these are not highlighted. Not yeah, they are not really giving the focus and the highlighting that's required. There you go. That's when you have somebody writing your history. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mm. you know, that, that, that is, that's a problem we have had. So... We, we have always read other people's account of us. Yeah. I mean, here we are in a country where some same British scholars described yeah. our culture as primitive, That's and true. colonial, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And, um, and here we are. So I'm always very cautious about who says what. Oh, okay. It's interesting to know that. Now, at Independence, we're very excited because there's a dawn of a new era. What are the ideals that informed our independence? What did we set out to do right from the beginning? Yeah, this is a very important question. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah had, had a set of ideas. You see, Kwame Nkrumah had been educated in the West. He knew about the strength of America. He knew about Europe. He had come from America to Europe. He had worked among trade unionists, he had worked among uh, black Americans, Du Bois, and then George Padmore, the Caribbeans, and those uh, who had gone to the Pan-African Congresses uh, before. And, and I always want to say that just as Kenyatta was not the one who founded Kenya, okay. the Mau was already there, but he's considered the one who led the struggle to independence. Again, when we talk about Mandela, we talk about, there were a number of people, the ANC started operating in the 20s, okay. but Mandela led them to majority rule. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm saying this to come back to the point about who really is... Yeah. In, whether the founder or founder's question, which whether where we put the apostrophe is important. Yeah, it's, it's not, because a lot of people work towards it. Mm -hmm. It's not like the AUCC is my university, right? <laughs> yes, of course. So I, 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 I drew the program, mm -hmm. I looked for the resources, and uh, put it together and said, I have founded a university. Mm -hmm. That is founding. You know, but if others had started, they didn't 
make it. I came and continued from there and so on and so forth. You can't say one person is a founder. Neither will you say all of them are founders. Brilliant. I would rather go to who led the final leg. I mean, like a relay, you know, who okay. led the final leg. So mm. the ideal CS, so when I was making this, Kwame Nkrumah had already determined, you know, from America through Britain, through all the organizations that he formed that Ghana was going to be independent, particularly from the 1945 Congress in Manchester, where Mandela, sorry, Jobo Kenyatta moved from there, went to Kenya, his Banda left and went to, um, to what we call the Nyaza land now, you know, then Rhodesia. And um, Awolo Owo, or Zik, also went to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So they all met at a certain time saying, we are going back to help the liberation of our country. What was the liberation for? The liberation was not just for their countries. And that's why Kwame Nkrumah made that famous statement, the independence of Ghana is meaningless. Unless it is. Unless it is. And that is why I'm saying Ghana is not independent. It's one of the reasons. Oh, okay. Yeah. I it's see. a major idea. We sure should be able to come to that point. Right. Yeah. So Ghana should be, sh should be seen as part of a greater Africa. It wasn't okay. just the narrow path of granting independence. He made it quite clear. That statement, sometimes we overlook it or we, we just say it without realizing the import of it. But it's a major, major ideal of our independence. Our independence is meaningless. So in the second verse of our national anthem, it mentions along with the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. So w staying away from the rest of Africa or staying away from our neighbors and thinking we are independent, it's not, it's not totally true. And then again, look at our economic structure, mm -hmm. the structure of our economy. We have only been producing raw materials. We haven't done much. We saw commodities, gold, cocoa, and all the others, if I had the new ones, including oil, you know, all of them. We have not added value. The same structure from independence. So how independent have we been? If you look at our acad you know, academics, uh, we look at the statement that Kwame Nkrumah made at the um, opening of the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, mm -hmm. and he made it quite clear, it is time for academics to now go back, not copy what the thoughts that they've been, what we've been working with, because we have been made to lose our own history, our own culture, and our past. So we should go back and relearn, reinterpret, that's the word Kwame Nkrumah used. And we have not gone back. All the books we are using are virtually the same books that we're using at Independence. A few Africans have written the books, but how much research have we done to go back to learn about our past? Kwame Nkrumah also made the point that we should go back to learn uh, about the history of the blacks in the diaspora, their culture, and then link them up to what we are doing. So what uh, Barbados Prime Minister was saying the other yeah. day, linking up the Caribbean and uh, Ghana and Africa was supposed to be the natural thing. I thought we did that through the ACP, the African Caribbean and Pacific Nations Grouping. We formed a group like that mm -hmm. in 75 along the line. Yes, we tried that only for trade, but now only a couple of um, months ago, we had the uh, Caribbean CARICOM and African yeah. leaders, you know, starting the kind of uh, dialogue that from 1945 had not been held. So all these things were truncated along the line and now we probably have to go back to it because without those kind of connections, I cannot see us say we are independent. Independent is only a name. It's only a name. We, 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 At least we, we are not under the control of the British, isn't it? We are oh, attached from colonialism. We are at the core of it, oh, haven't we? We are we, still attached to colonialism. I mean, our thoughts, our minds, our thinking, and everything. 
we, it's, it's going to take some time for us to take conscious steps. By the way, 65 years. It's not, it's not been 10, 20 or 65 good years. Yeah, what have we done? If we, a man started working believe, at the time, the man would have retired at birth. The person would have retired at 65. But here we are. We don't have self-confidence. Really? No. In the Republic of Ghana? We don't. Collectively, that's the state. Oh, my God. I mean, look at how many... Uh, how we, many? We've had the leaders. We have the promises yeah. of this period. In fact, we have a president. Very bold. Oh, well, that, well and all of that. These are these are ceremonial. Um, these are ceremonial activities. Really? I, I'm serious. We are. What thinking is still not African. Seriously? No, we are alienated from our society. We are alienated from our society in the sense that here we are. We leave our villages, we come to the city, we are alienated from them. We are alienated from our customs, our culture, our background. And so when we go back, we even laugh at them. Look at social media. Somebody cannot speak English. We make fun of the person and then we laugh at the person in social media. We have somebody, a member of parliament from Akwetia, who is elected by popular vote and uh, the whole, you know, elite world makes fun of her. She cannot come again because we have not made even the uh, allowance for her to be able to express herself. But by fairness, is it not the case that if you really truly want to represent the people in a constituency, at least you should be in the position to contribute to lawmaking? If she, she's not elected in that area, how is it possible is this not really the realities on the ground? So, that, how did it happen that she was elected? Of course, she had popular support. I mean, regardless okay. of that. And so, the people wanted her. Ah, there you go. So, it's like saying, we have a chief, popularly elected. Yeah. Or, and the chief cannot speak English at, on, on television. Therefore, we must laugh at him. The, Look, only, the only problem here is that the chief is not supposed to make laws in parliament. He's not supposed to represent and actually push for their interest uh -huh. here. That's the problem. That there the come a time that virtually everything that's written in that house is in English. Raymond, that's where we go wrong. Really? If you go to India, there are, there are more than 100 languages in their parliament. Mm -hmm. Local languages. Can we do that? They have interpretation facilities. You see, but to we, be fair, our laws also allow that people can speak in the local language in parliament. Yes, so we should make the effort to put interpreters there. Okay. So, you see, we, this is this are part of the this is part of the problem. We are not looking at our culture, our values, how people express themselves. Listen, have you watched um, Ghanaians singing during Christmas or even in church mm -hmm. when they are singing in their own local languages? Mm -hmm. You see the expression. It's more free. Yeah. It's more liberated mm -hmm. than when they are singing the hymns that they do not understand and that kind of thing. So to express yourself freely, that is for me independence. You are, you've, you, you've, you've declared yourself independent from what is making, uh, limiting you. And that is what is happening in Parliament. But to be if, fair, though, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a huge number of radio stations. In fact, the mass radio network is predominated by those in the local languages. There you know. So Th that's progress, right? Some amount of progress. Some amount of progress. See, I, I was expecting you to say yes. Is no. indeed a lot of progress? Some amount. Okay, because, because I mean, the people you are talking about. They get to be part of the conversation about nation building, mm -hmm. about uh, what they call it, uh, political participation, all through these networks. If it is 99%, about. I will say we are independent. I see. See, language defines you. Okay. Look at us. We say we have all been to school. If you put a fancy script there, <laughs> Uh, you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, some are fancy in name. Yeah. Precisely. Mm -hmm. I will not talk about those from Manke Seaman. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but seriously, mm. we, you see, we use a certain term, illiterate. Yeah. And then we refer to those who cannot speak English. So, least speaking, it is those who cannot do anything in their own languages who are illiterate. I see. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You see, we, th this is the way, uh, the, 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 our thinking, way of thinking 
has to be decolonized. This is what I'm saying. That's the, when I talk about independence. Look at now, thank God, um, AU has now recognized Swahili as a, as a, as a mainstream language. Mm -hmm. Go to East Africa. See how freely people speak confidently when they are speaking Swahili. I'm not saying we shouldn't speak English, but it is their language. Um, when they started uh, you know, teaching, and I studied Swahili at the University of Ghana. Okay. I loved it, yeah. I still I love see. it. Yeah. My time at the University of Ghana, the people dreaded it. They didn't want to study it. In fact, they thought it was a proper punishment for not getting extremely wonderful grades, actually. Not just so, Swahili. Yeah. Even French. During Krumah's time, we were in secondary school. And, and uh, even at the time that I became director of the Ghana Institute of Journalism, French was compulsory. I see. And it's natural. You have your neighbors next door. Mm -hmm. And then we formed the Ministry of Regional Integration. If you went to Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, even Burkina Faso, and you went to a conference of ministers, all their ministers were speaking English. That's true. English speaking ministers couldn't speak French. <laughs> That's true. It happened to be at the Equus office too. There you go. There are a lot of people who there who are from the Francophone world who are able to speak English. There you go. But the English people were deficient. So you in the see language. the kind of laziness I'm talking about. So we we've grabbed the English. We think it is our language. It's our second language. But can we change this? Is it not too late? It's because there are homes where kids are being trained in English and they cannot speak their local language. I mean, but th th there's a question at the back of all of this. Yes. There's a question that the young man is asking through my ears and it's so clear yeah. that how does this affect bread and butter issues because the people believe that they are independent the ability to afford meals feed their families and make sure they live a better life the standard of living is that how is his ability to speak french or any language related to this important how is your nuance and competence in the local language really an added advantage in any way you know what during elections mm -hmm. we go to the villages to ask for their votes. Yeah. We try, we try where we can to speak their language. If you want them to do anything meaningful, speak in their local language. Why? Because majority of them will not understand your big English. Mm. Right? Mm. But when you've gotten the power, you come back to Accra and then all that they see, they see you through um, Joy FM speaking big English, which is fine. But the point is that communication is so important. You see, we, we take it for granted that, oh, because we are here, our people understand everything. No. If every Ghanaian went back to his or her village every weekend and communicated with the people, uh, attended their festivals, uh, worked with them, Gonna be a different place, but you and I come to Accra, and we think the villagers are disturbing us. So um, we don't want to go to their festivals. I remember in the seventies during the Achampong regime, all public servants were even giving vacation to go back to their villages to join in festivals. Mm -hmm. Very meaningful, because what it meant is that. Festivals were not just for reunion or gathering around, um, you know, their leaders and so on, but there were also times to talk about development. You know how it has affected our development? People don't realize it. Development was planned by the people themselves during these festivals. These days, because the townspeople do not go, the DC comes up and calls on government to come and help them. So every festival, you see the chief reading sometimes, reading some English that he does not understand if he has not gone to school, mm -hmm. and calling on the president or the minister to do something for the community. So self-help is gone. Self-help is gone. Every community is looking. That's why we are chasing MPs. That's why we are chasing 
uh, ministers. Otherwise, if you voted for somebody to make laws in parliament, why do we blame them for, for, for roads or for some basic community center, public toilets? But it's not what they promise. That, that's different from, I mean, if the people promise that I would build schools, I would build virtually every infrastructure in the community, and we are demanding that they live up to their promise, there's really nothing wrong with that. It's an active participatory society that does that. Yeah. It, but it also shows our misunderstanding of this system that we are dealing with. I mean, you are mem I've been a member of parliament for eight years. Mm -hmm. And once you become a parliament parliamentarian, look at the pressures that come upon you. Apart from... Pressures you invite for yourself. Because I, you become a member of parliament. No, because you actually told the people these are the things you do No, no, no. What I'm saying, the pressure is like, oh, I want you to pay my school fees. I want you to pay my children's uh, hospital bills. Yes. I want... Those are real. Yes, I agree. That you did not promise. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it could be that you didn't promise. You that. didn't promise. <laughs> Even at the time, the child might not be in school anyway. So, uh, Raymond, what I'm using this to show is that even the system of governance okay. is not ours. This current oh, democracy yeah. we are running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But does it matter? It does. Why so? Um, in 1992, I don't know how old you were, we had a preferendum in this country. Mm -hmm. The this one for the constitution. This is another, and then committee went around asking people what type of governance did you want? A few maybe less than 10 percent said they wanted a form similar to the traditional form of governance and majority i think 67 percent said they wanted a multi-party system now we have not been able to create any traditional governance system that is relevant to africa really oh yes the, 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 the chiefs are basically the ones that are appointed with other people to the 30 percent that are available oh, the that is concept. a token recognition there's a national house of chiefs they are ah. consistently consulted yeah in fact chiefs make it to the council of state consistently you see how we have taken over the pride of tradition before the before independence mm -hmm. now we are talking independence yeah. chiefs in their various places, maintain the system. Although we say that the British did um, divide and rule, mm -hmm. they maintain the system. Some resisted the British, go to South Africa, the Zulu kings, the Ashantis. They, they, they really, they didn't just resist, they fought mm -hmm. against them. Now they gain independence, and they say the chiefs should only contribute to 10% or thirty percent. Why didn't we make them the bedrock of our traditional system? And again, don't forget. But how, how democratic would that be? Wait, because they are not they are not, they are not elected like any other person to be there. There you go. Some of them think that they are God given right to rule, but clearly, how, how does it then become the point? So how does a, a, a minority group in an area where a majority chief is ever get to be in proper office? Because they'll never be cheap anyway. Raymond, let's, let's put this hypothesis. Sometimes some people do not want to think that far. What, how were we doing without the British system? Oh, well, the different groups were ruling under chiefs. Now, what I'm saying is that, and we had philosophies, this, you know, which were, which were representatives representative of the kind of rule that we had. Why didn't our academics, and it's not too late, create new systems of government based on what we had before? This is what I'm saying. You see, all that we did was to impose on us what the British Parliament had, mm -hmm. what the now we are the US, in, we are in a hybrid. You know, we have a hybrid and the French and any system of government, or for that matter, any uh, system you choose, should be based on the culture of the people. 
it lasts better. As it is, we, we do not even know what our heroes and the heroines did. What did they say? What did they do? That's why we are not learning our history. We do not know our culture. And we are think we are, yeah, we've come on, on board with uh, the new... A modernized system. In so-called, we call it modernized. It's but that's the current trend. Democracy is what's actually ruling the world today. What would you depart from that and establish for yourself an alien system? Ah, that should be our original. That we will call our own system. You see, in the 60s, we fell victim to what we call the Cold War. Yeah. The West and the East. Mm -hmm. All the countries in Africa that were fighting for independence, for one reason or the other, allied with the Soviets or the Chinese. The reason being that they were the ones who were supporting our liberation movements. Yeah. So you had communism and then Western democracy. Yeah. With time, Western democracy won the day. That's true. That didn't make it the only system. China is still going on with its own system and it's now supplying the whole world with with food and products. Yes. China is still communist and it is still, why? It is based on their system. But is it not, is it not democracy that has actually helped us stabilize up to this they day? They call this a democracy as well. Yeah. It's their system. Oh, okay. What I'm saying is that it is their system. The Indians, they call it their system. The Indians were also colonized. But why are they not behaving like we are doing? They started from the beginning and saw that they could develop with their small-scale industries. Mm -hmm. When President Clinton was going to India, to Madras, look at the technological power of India. They developed it themselves. They, they went to school in America, they went to school in Europe, but they developed their own system. And that's why I'm saying that Indians go to parliament, they speak their own local language. They provided interpretation in the parliament for as many languages as there are in India. And so when I say that we are not independent, I'm talking about this. Again, all these countries that are so big and we look so tiny in their faces, they are big. Yeah. So when we, we say that Ghana's independence is meaningless unless it is linked up with that of Africa. Yeah. That is what I mean. So we are, cannot say we are independent when we are sitting here, tiny Ghana, negotiating with big China. But I don't know why we have ECOWAS, we have a AU, we have all of these blocks that we have agreed to <laughs> at least have some economic union with. Raymond, in 19, 1963, 64, 65, we had a template. Mm -hmm. in Ghana to form the United States of Africa. Yeah. The template is still there. All that we needed to do was to cede part of our independence and then join other African countries to form the uh, organization, not just organization of African Union, that was only a compromise, yeah. but to form a continental government of Africa. Can you imagine? Never mind that, yeah, there, a whole lot has happened since then. But imagine that we had a continental government of Africa. And Africa was negotiating with China, with one voice, with all our resources, with all our human power, with all, you know, all that God gave us. Wouldn't we be in a better place? Wouldn't we be stronger? Wouldn't we have eliminated more of this poverty? Wouldn't we also have had, a, a, you know, a, a continent with values that will help us to overcome some of the problems that we are having. Were these ideals not utopian? I don't need you to answer the question now. I'll come back and I saw your face light up when I said that. <laughs> After the break, which we'll be backing on now, we'll be answering that particular question about whether they were feasible, realistic ideals right from the beginning and which path we'll take to amend things and get on the right path. That's after this break.
You welcome back to our front. My name is Raymond Dakwa. My guest today is the Honorable Kojoyanka. Uh, 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 and uh, I did spend some time telling you about who he is, if you didn't know. But to make it short, he's actually the founding president of the Africa University College of Communications. And you sure would know that institution, but he's done a lot of things. He's perhaps the gentleman who, when they say, you can pull somebody from one region and make him a regional minister in another place, and he will deliver so well for you. That example they gave. They give two names. They, they mention Mila, then they will say Yanka too. That example is the person that's my guest here. He's been MP too, so perhaps Parliament's part of the conversation we've been having here. That's why he brought in the part of the parliamentarian who cannot speak English and how you shouldn't have mocked that particular person. But before we went to the break, I asked the question whether at independence our ambitions were realistic enough, whether they were not utopian, whether they were not really outrageous things that were not feasible regardless of the period that we found ourselves in. You welcome back. Thank you, Raymond. In 1619, when the British settled in some part of Virginia in America, we didn't have a United States of America. Yeah. It took one person. But for them, it took a civil war on the back of blacks mm. to get a United States of Africa. America. Sorry, America. Right? The same, the Chinese went through their revolution. And look at them now. Solid. They were not just one group of people living in one village. Various tribes, various languages. They chose Mandarin. Now Mandarin is the language of China. And they are the second most powerful, if not the first most powerful country in the world. I used to travel through the Union, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, mm -hmm. uh, which was dismantled by Gorbachev at some point. And now uh, Putin is handling a strong Russian empire. Listen, numbers give you the might. Numbers give you the strength. It gives you confidence. Kwame Nkrumah saw it long ago. And not just Kwame Nkrumah. Sometimes we forget. J.B. Dankwa was a member of the West African Students' Union. When um, Ethiopia was fighting for its liberty from the Italians, it was part of the student union group that went to support uh, the Ethiopians. I see. So we have, we have nationalists who all wished that we could all be independent. It, there's nothing Ethiopian. When the, um, in 1945, all those leaders of, the, of Africa and of African descent met in Manchester, of course, that time they did not talk about unity, but they were all going, around, going back to their country to fight for liberation. But at the back of their minds, they said, we should get united. And then, of course, W.B. Du Bois made that statement, that when we are all meet, met together, and we have thought together, and we have united our efforts, then the confidence of the black man will rise. Very deep. And that tells you that, and what is an ideal? You, it's an ideal for which you fight. And that is what Kwame Nkrumah and all the others who came did. Ghana, Guinea, Mali, mm. they started. And they were moving forward until Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. So, it's, it, there's, and there's nothing magical about it. Africa is a continent, it's a regional grouping. It's there. They meet at OAU. People say, oh, language will be a problem. When they meet at OAU, what language do they speak? <laughs> okay, interesting, yes. Of course, I mean, there's still... So, let, let us, I think we should just forget about this. Is it too late? I, is it too late? It's not. It's not. Really? No, AU has said 2063. Unfortunately... Yeah, the Africa we want. Yeah. Unfortunately, that will be 100 years since Kwame Nkrumah, you know, um, put the template on the table. It could be earlier. There are, some, there are some who say that we are fixated over Nkrumah's ideas. It is Are not, we fixated over those? It is, not, is it that over, it's been almost 65 years as a country, Nkrumah died a long time ago. Things have changed. There are people who are questioning whether Nkrumah's ideas will be prudent and realistic even today. Were they ones that would fix our current economy? Are they those that can actually make us better off as a people today? 
today yeah. when the issues are to do with the city, when yeah. the issues are to do with whether or not we are doing enough production and providing jobs for the young people in this country. Yeah. How, how important are those historical ideals that really, in a technology-driven world today, might not be so relevant? All countries in the world, mm -hmm. all leaders in the world, all peoples of the world, all those who are, no matter where they are, they are quoting the elders okay. of their countries. I'm not saying Kwame Nkrumah should be brought back. Yeah. The ideas that he left behind. When Kwame Nkrumah was opening the Institute of African Studies in 1965, he mentioned, among other scholars, J.B. Dankwa, who must be studied. Okay. He mentioned Kesley Hayford. He mentioned uh, Ephraim Amon. He mentioned... These are people whose ideas he also cherished. Okay. So when you talk about Kwame Nkrumah, one is not saying just Kwame Nkrumah. But one thing for Kwame Nkrumah is that he wrote books. He wrote over 20 books. Oh, I see. I, I know six of them. Oh. <laughs> and you, you are... Oh, really? I read six. I actually thought I'd read oh. almost all of them. You see, he wrote on everything. He mm -hmm. wrote philosophy. He wrote history. Yeah, he... conscientious, so, for example. And, and, and therefore, it's out of our own doing. And I'm saying we should read every leader's books. Mm -hmm. But he had the opportunity to, to lead the country. And he had a template working with a lot of people. Kwame Nkrumah brought in um, West Indians. He brought in people of African descent, Du Bois, George mm -hmm. Padmore. And they all brought their ideas together. And he put them together from the template. I think at Louis. Uh, the first economist was also Caribbean. Yeah. The, the, the man who helped out with the seven-year development plan. Right. So the point is that if I'm a leader, I will go back to what has happened before. Look at the template. Is there something we can, we can work on? But is there a template for, for example, our current economic difficulties? We are in a, the, in a very difficult position. I said so, that we had an economy from independence. Yeah. Kwame Nkrumah was trying to wean our economy away from the colonial structure we inherited. Mm -hmm. I worked in Gehawk, luckily. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had over 30 subsidiaries around this country. Every region had an industry. Every region. And because I worked in PR department, I had the privilege of visiting all the divisions around okay. this country. So if you like, they, they were like the president of the one district, one factory. I they see. were there. I mean, uh, a boss who go to Western region. Yeah, boss, but they collapsed. The 350 or so, they collapsed. There you go. You see, the collapse is just a, an easy way of saying it. We collapsed it. It was... Uh, the government, one of our governments which decided to dissolve Gihok because some of the industries were not making profit. I agree. But I worked in Gihok. But I know that the profit that those who are doing making profit were making covered almost the rest. So all that we needed to do was to recover them. Um, they were state-owned. Okay, you want to privatize Go to Malaysia. They were following the same path. What happened is they decided, therefore, that they will negotiate. First, they gave it to workers as cooperatives. Workers could not. So they involved the workers in the management until some of them went into private hands. And look at Malaysia. Malaysia did not abandon their leader. Yeah. Mahathir's ideas were the ideas that built Malaysia. So mm. despite the fact that he's now almost 100 or if not more, they still remember him. He was not the only wise person, but the point Thank is you. that his ideas helped to build it. The, the, the point I was asking you about whether, yeah. I mean, uh, those ideas are relevant to our current state, whether it will help us face our economy, whether it will help us, for example, we have a parliament that's in the form of a stalemate, a parliament that's struggling to have consensus on virtually everything. You've been, par you've been in parliament before. People say this is the first time we have such a very difficult situation to deal with. How do we resolve a problem like that? No, I mean, what, what's, what's wrong with it? It's, a, it's only a phase in our history. It's not going to be the same every day. You know, we, you see, th this is where our laziness comes in. Really? Uh, uh, yeah. 
You see, w we must be creative in finding solutions to every problem. Sometimes we hit a wall and then we stand helpless. And we stand helpless because we think, oh, there is no... So where is the key? We are looking for the key. For there's excessive partisanship in that parliament. Who brought excessive partisanship? It's the system. Okay. It's the system. Now, look at our traditional form of traditional system. If our academics, our scholars, had done a lot of research to find out how best can we you know, prescribe a system of governance that takes into consideration the traditional ideals of society, togetherness, mm -hmm. we have it. In the, in the assembly of the palace, people disagree. But they come to a consensus, consensus building. So who, who, who gave us this idea of, you know, opposition and so on? There's nothing opposition in our, in our traditional language. You're not opposition. If you disagree with me, where did opposition come from? What is the fantasy of opposition? I don't know. There you go. Yes. Yeah. You know, it shows you that we borrowed it. It's a borrowed system. It's, I worry about it. I'm serious. That... We, 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 all our universities, and this is where creativity comes in. They should go to work. You know, our researchers should go to work. Our um, political science researchers, new systems of governance. Whoever thought that China, with its communist system, will rule the world today? Here they are. If you say that communism is bad, see what is on the ground. Or for that matter, look at the power of uh, Russia. Even when it was dismantled as a union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Look at Putin alone. You know, so don't, it, it's, and uh, their scholars are working. Um, Mama Gaddafi tried a system, the third, the third world, the third theory, of saying that, we should create assemblies in all our communities so that the power will go back to them. He was not allowed to get out to other parts of Africa and then he was eliminated. But he set together a big research bureau of scholars. That's what Africa should do. And AU can do it. Set, set together a team of researchers. We have Ubuntu as a philosophy in South Africa. What is Ubuntu? You're basically challenging the fundamentals of our governance. That's what we should challenge. We should. If we don't, we are not independent. <laughs> really? <laughs> because, I mean, some feel that we are already in a democratic path. This is the path oh, to go. Oh, 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 that is somebody's democracy. We can have our African democracy. I mean, what... China calls it democracy. Go to what well for people. It's actually what for the state. It's no, what predominantly is the, what's your the results elsewhere. What is the what is elsewhere? <laughs> Look at Cuba. The countries with the higher GDP today, the well, countries with uh -huh. the Western countries, uh -huh. the Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm. those countries, they are the ones who are running democracy. And oh. it's working so well for oh, them. Why don't you talk about America? Why don't you talk about the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, they also, yeah. You see, those countries also have their own cultures. Mm -hmm. So they have welfare systems that America or the UK cannot have. That's you true. see, so something unique, when you talk about independence, that's what it means. Mm. Yes, we believe in the general thing. But if you talk about democracy is the rule of the people, it can mean a lot. Let the people decide. But where you also have the power in the hands of only a few people, or the media in the hands of only a few people, or the banks in the hands of a few people. And you say, oh, okay, we have democracy, so you're happy. <laughs> but you find that everything that you're doing is dictated from somewhere. Is that independence? When you want to write your budget, you need to go to an external body to check whether they approve of your budget. Is that independence? It's, it's, it's interesting, though. I mean, there, yeah. there, there, there are some concluding remarks I want from you uh, about what's currently happening in the Republic. Are we heading in the right direction? Ghana. I mean, after all that, you said, I'm so doubtful whether we are, but... I, I think we should halt at some point and have a national conversation. About what? The economy? 
the Gartner system. Not just system. the economy, everything. Everything. We should question. You see, it's unfortunate I'm even making this statement, but most of our scholars and academics all now want to go into politics. It's a shame. Really? Oh, that's where you get your post and you get, you know, all the goodies. What's wrong with that? It's ambition. They, they, they choose what? Yeah, I, there's nothing wrong. Elsewhere, you see academics spending more time in research. Here we are. We are never even science-oriented. Almost journalism, and, you know, I'm also a victim of it in a way. Mm -hmm. we, we're dealing more with politics than, say, science. We are dealing more, but the kind of things that really affects our growth, we don't even talk about climate change. We talk about Galamse when people are arrested, yeah. but the depth of ownership of our natural resources has not come up. So when we talk about economy, it's fine. You know, we, 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 we only double in the areas which are comfortable. But really, if you say that, go to Obuasi. Obuasi, you've dug gold for more than 120 years. Look at the roofs of the buildings in Obuasi and ask yourself, is this development? Go to Takwa. Go to Hafasini, where we used to have a glass factory. And see, go to Konongo. We have dug gold. We should, these are the questions. So I'm saying, we ourselves, including journalists, we should be asking a lot of questions. Are we really on the right path? So my, my answer to your question is that we should take a step back and ask questions, everything. Our history and the world history now, people are researching, new findings are coming out. I recently found out that Edinkra symbols originated from ancient Egypt. It is a new finding. But what I'm saying is that people are working. People mm. are researching. But we are saying what we have is all right because everybody is doing it. No, it's not. Prof, I think this conversation, <laughs> we need to do a lot of series on it to make it more uh, uh, engaging and actually bring it to the tables of virtually everybody that matters in the Republic of Ghana. But for now, I'm grateful for your time. And since we have agreed to do more of the conversations, I'm sure we can make it another time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's where we end today's edition of Upfront. My guest is a man who understood it all and probably put it in perspective for all of us. I hope he's giving you enough to chew on and have a proper reflection on our independence and whether or not we are truly independent as a people. Anyway, we did a poll. The poll, 81% of you said we are not truly independent. And... Uh, I gave some of the questions, answers to this too. But thank you so much for joining us.